Well, thank you guys. Um, as always, that is my favorite time of the night. I love uh, getting a chance to hear from you guys and giving you the first word and um, uh, collectively, right? We're, we're trying to attend to the voice of God together as a community. So uh, I know sometimes that's difficult and I know sometimes we were trying to figure out how is God speaking to me and is he, is he speaking to me through that sermon that I heard or that book I read or that time when I went for a walk or what, but keep, keep trying, right? Keep paying attention. Um, if you want, you can uh, move to speaker view and um, don't be offended uh, to turn your uh, cameras off. You can keep them on or off, whatever you like. Um, so I think I know everybody here tonight. So um, if you don't know me, my name is James. I am the director of our campus ministry here. And um, honestly, I'm so glad for everybody who came out tonight. Uh, I know as Victor was saying, uh, the extroverts are excited right now and I'm one of them. Uh, so great to see everyone's faces. Um, so tonight we are starting a new series and I titled this series, Everyone a Mentor, Everyone a Mentee. Because this series is all about answering two main questions. Who is your Paul and who is your Timothy? Right? Who is mentoring you and who are you mentoring? Uh, my family's been watching a lot of Star Wars. So who is your Yoda? Who is your Padwan? <laughs> um, so this is why. This, one of the major transitions from childhood to becoming a young adult is being able to reflect on and recognize who has taught you, who has influenced you, who has helped you. Um, who's helped you become the person you are today and, you know, for better or for worse, for reals. And what I want to talk to you tonight about is the fact that up until this point in your life, probably the vast majority of you um, have likely been receiving passive mentoring. So our parents play this role, our teachers, coaches, pastors, a variety of people probably in your life have been role models to you. And what I mean by passive mentoring is that you didn't sign up for it. Um, maybe you didn't even know it was happening to you. Like that time when you're doing the dishes and you're stacking them in a strange way and your roommate says, hey, why do you do that that way? And you say, I don't know, this is how I was taught. This is how I always do it. Doesn't everybody do it this way? Passive mentoring. Um, Passive mentoring is when you are absorbing knowledge, skills, or resources from another without any deliberate intention. But part of what it means to enter into this stage of young adulthood and kind of from here on in life is that now you are, it's on you to take responsibility in this area. First, for being intentional and more deliberate in who you are being mentored by, and then secondly, by taking responsibility that of the fact that others are going to start looking up to you, right? So what kind of role model are you going to be? Now, up until this point in the talk, this is just, you know, I'm just talking about mentoring. But let's talk about a Christian perspective on mentoring. Um, a guy named Jim Houston, James Houston, he was the... Uh, uh, he was the um, founding professor of Regent College, the seminary he went to. He wrote a book called The Mentored Life. And in this book, he talks about what he means by that title is that the pursuit of wholeness can't simply come through finding mentors that will help us along the way, but we need to submit ourselves to a mentored life, a life of Christian discipleship to Jesus. Jesus is the only mentor who can, on an ongoing basis kind of way, mentor us into true wholeness and personhood. And so he says, you know, we need to live a mentored life, one that is one, one that is submitted to Christ. When I first joined um, UCM uh, way back in the day when I was in Vancouver, I, qu I, I quickly picked up on a saying that was kind of similar in UCM, and it's sort of this DNA, this, this passage of scripture that is central to us. And instead of the mentored life, I remember hearing people talk about the 2 Timothy 2-2 two, two life, the 2 Timothy 2-2 two, two way of life. Um, 
I don't know how many of you are familiar with that passage. I don't know if you know it on the back of your hand, like, you know, John 3.16 or like the Great Commission, but you should. This is the passage you should know, like the Great Commission. Um, in fact, if I remember correctly, I think it was one of the first UCM retreats that I went to. Uh, and uh, we had, our speaker was Brady Bobbink, and he's a campus pastor in Bellingham who's been doing this for 40 years. <laughs> and he, um, I remember in his talk, he talked about this passage of scripture and he said, he wants that passage of scripture engraved on his tombstone when he dies. He wants it to say, here lies Brady Bobbink. He lived the 2 Timothy 2-2 two -two life until the end. Okay, I know you're now you really want to know what this passage says, but one more second, a bit of context. So when when Paul is writing the second letter to Timothy, uh, Paul has the sense that he's going to die soon. Um, most scholars believe that that uh, Second Timothy was Paul's last letter. It was his last final preserved letter because he's sitting in a Roman prison. He doesn't expect to be released, and the fact is he was executed shortly you know, after he probably sent this letter. And this letter reads like that. It reads like this last will and testament. Um, there's a line in it where he says, I am already being poured out like a drink offering and the time for my departure is near. I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I have kept the faith. Okay. So think about that. Paul's dying wishes. What, what would he say to his, to his disciple? What would he say to his mentee, you know, Timothy? Um, he says this in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, he says, And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Did you catch that? The things you've heard me say entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. So this isn't just a, a request to Timothy to pass the baton. He's not saying, hey, I just wish Timothy that you would you know, find another protege. He, Paul is saying to Timothy, hey, here's the master plan. Don't just find people to mentor like I mentored you, but find reliable people who will also mentor others. It's, it's a, a third generation impact that Paul is calling on him from. He's saying, you know, it's going to go from Paul to Timothy, to Timothy, to reliable people, to reliable people who will teach others. Paul expresses this as this kind of dying wish. Everyone a mentor, everyone a mentee. And so I want to ask you guys tonight, who is your Paul? Who is your Timothy? The Bible is full of mentor and mentee relationships. Um, and these relationships uh, are where the mentor is helping the mentee experience and know God. Over and over again, we see relationships where um, they're trying to help them to hear the voice of God, to obey God, to fulfill the calling that God has on their life, right? You can think of Moses and Joshua, or Samuel and Eli, or Elisha and Elijah. You guys could probably think of more. But the relationship that we get the most insight into is this one of Paul and Timothy. And what I want to do now is kind of dial it back um, and take a look at that first incident when Paul meets Timothy and Paul calls Timothy. So if we look back in Acts chapter 16, probably, probably like 20 years before this final letter, we, we see Paul for, when he first meets Timothy. So if you go to Acts 16, it says this, it says, Paul came to Derb and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The believers in Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was Greek. And as they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. And so the churches were strengthened in faith and grew daily in numbers. So why does Timothy go with Paul? The text doesn't, you know, when I dug into it, I was like, wow, it doesn't really say a lot, does it? 
doesn't give us a lot to go on, but I think we can make a few inferences. First, obviously Timothy was attracted to Paul. He was attracted to his message, his integrity, his effectiveness, his abilities. Paul was, this is now, this is Paul coming on a second loop in chapter 16. He returning to the places that he had shared the gospel previously. So he had been to, to um, where, where, Paul, where Timothy is. He had been there before, um, just a couple chapters earlier. And now he's returning to check in and see how the believers are doing. So likely Timothy would have heard the gospel first from Paul, um, if not, you know, because of Paul. Timothy would have likely either seen him in action sharing the gospel or heard about him. Timothy likely might have even seen the person that, that Paul healed while he was there. Um, Timothy definitely would have heard about how Paul was nearly stoned to death and yet miraculously survived and carried on and continued to be a champion for the mission of the gospel. Either, either he was an eyewitness of this stuff or he was brought up and told about it. And so, you know, mentors attract mentees by their way of life. You guys are going to attract others by your way of life, what you do. I think secondly, Timothy, um, you know, he had a teachable spirit. Uh, Timothy's mother and grandmother were strong believers. We read about this. Um, they clearly shaped the beginning of his faith. Um, but I'm guessing that as a teenager, as a young adult here in this moment, I'm sure Timothy's mother knew that he needed another mentor figure. He needed a father figure in his life, help him into this next stage of discipleship. And that's my, my worry is that um, I hear this too often. Too many youth, too many young adults today uh, walking away from faith because they've never had models. They've never had mentors of faith. They've never had people to look up to. They've never had people who are living it out, willing to spend time with them to pass along what they've learned in Christ. And so Timothy, I think this text shows us he's, he's got a teachable spirit. At a very young age, he's saying, hey, I, I wanna follow Paul. I wanna, I wanna be discipled in, his, you know, in the ways of Jesus through him. But most importantly, and you know, what we know for sure from the text here, what's obvious from the text here is that Timothy goes with Paul because he was invited. Timothy responds to an invitation. And remember our two big questions tonight. Who is your Paul? Who is your Timothy? And here's my thought is that if you, if you don't have answers for either of those questions, then you probably have to ask yourself, have you extended an invitation to others yet? Have you ever extended an invitation to someone and said, hey, I want to help you, I want to mentor you, I want to, I want to help you along in this journey? Or have you received an invitation to be mentored but didn't take, up, take it up? Um, last summer, uh, when Josh and Aiden came on staff, I was so pumped. And I was like, hey, we have, we've just doubled our ability to uh, mentor and disciple students. And, um, and so we did that. You know, each, each one of us said, hey, we're going to you know, put out invitations and invite people to be intentionally discipled. And I was so encouraged by how many of you said yes. And, uh, and some of those groups are ongoing right now, some of those huddles. And not just some of our staff, but I know some of our student leaders have offered to do that. Right now we have core groups and that's another shape and form that we're doing to, to you know, disciple and invest in people. Timothy and Paul's mentoring relationship began because of an intentional invitation and an acceptance of that invitation. And then over the next 20 years, you know, Paul mentors Timothy, he takes him under his wing, he's discipling him with the intention of passing the baton, right? Paul teaches him how to pray, how to worship, teaches him how to walk in the spirit. He teaches him church life and how to select elders. <laughs> he teaches him how to discern false teachers, how to protect the weak and seek peace, how to pursue faith and hope and love. Paul passes on every resource of wisdom, knowledge, insight, skill, every good gift that he's received in Jesus passes on that Timothy might know Jesus better, that he might walk in the same way. So what, what did Paul see in Timothy? 
You know, what, what, what does it take to be a candidate, you know, of a mentoring relationship like that? You know, did Paul seek out, you know, the, the brightest of the class, the one with the greatest potential, the greatest qualities, right? The one who has their life together the best. I don't know. What do we know about Timothy? Well, from First Timothy, Second Timothy, from the letters that we read uh, between Paul and Timothy, we, we know that Timothy was really young, right? Timothy felt immature, inexperienced in his role. Paul says, hey, don't let youth be a factor. Don't let them push you around, but set an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. We also know that Timothy was timid, right? Um, he, was, he was kind of a shy, reserved person, didn't have a lot of courage. Paul had to tell him, had to affirm him and say, hey, God didn't give us a spirit of cowardice but rather a spirit of power and love and self-discipline. We also know that Timothy was kind of a, a sickly kid, right? Timothy had stomach issues and was often ill. Um, those of you who like drinking wine, uh, wine drinkers' favorite passage in scripture, 1 Timothy 5, 23, Paul says to Timothy, stop drinking only water and use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses, right? So why did Paul choose Timothy? Well, if we look at, again, at his last letter in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, we read this. Um, Paul says, Timothy, I thank God for you. Night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. I long to see you again, for I remember your tears as we parted. And I will be filled with joy when we are together again. I remember your genuine faith. For you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I know that same faith continues strong in you. Paul's remembering kind of what it was like when he first met Timothy. And what he remembers is this quality of genuine faith. It's faithfulness. Paul saw genuine faith in Timothy. Sure, he was immature, timid, ill, but Paul saw that he had genuine faith, that he was a teachable person. He responded to the invitation. Now, I know many of you, when, I, you know, when, I've, when I've challenged students in the past, hey, who's your Paul? Who's your Timothy? Um, sometimes the pushback is like, hey, I'm, I'm not perfect. I'm not, I wouldn't be, make a great mentor. I don't really have much to give others, right? Uh, it's hard to find a good mentor. Who's a good mentor anyways? Uh, here's the thing. No, nobody's perfect. Um, and Christ didn't call us to be perfect. Only he's perfect. Uh, and, and I think actually mentors, one of the best thing we can learn from people is their hindsight right? The mistakes from the mistakes they've made, the things that, the ways they haven't been perfect. I think a mentor is someone whose hindsight can become your foresight, right? We're not called to be perfect examples, but we're, we're called to be a living example to others. We have to put on and demonstrate this faith. Why? Because a Christian mentor doesn't point to themselves, they point to Jesus and the ways that they've learned to follow Jesus. Paul understood that clearly. He, he was very clear about the ways that he wasn't perfect. And yet at the same time, he knew very clearly that he was called to, to make disciples of others, to mentor others. Paul said over and over this, this phrase about imitating him. First Corinthians 11.1, 1, he says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Philippians 4, 9, he says, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. In the second Thessalonians chapter three, he says, for you yourselves know you, uh, how you ought to imitate us because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor, we worked day and night that we might not be a burden to any, to any of you was not because we did not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. You don't have to be perfect, 
but we need to give people a living example. So as we wind this up, I want to answer just a couple, give you a bit of you know, practical application. Um, when, when you start to think about this, hey, what are, what are the marks of a healthy mentor? What, is that, what are the marks of a healthy mentor-mentee relationship? Well, I jotted down a few things that I could think of. And, and first would be, hey, look for someone that's humble, okay? Someone who knows that they don't know it all. Um, look for someone who's transparent, someone who's willing to share their lives, their faults. Look for someone who's willing to offer their time, right? Because time is the key, right, to all good relationships. But most importantly, look for someone who would simply be willing to help you attend to the presence and the voice of Jesus in your life. I think the main question of a mentoring, of Christian mentoring relationship needs to be the question, hey, how are you experiencing the presence of Jesus in your life? And, and it's just that kind of question over and over and over again, to be honest. Um, just sort of simply asking, hey, of the things that you're talking about, when you get together and you talk about what's going on and the issues and the decisions that you have, you keep just asking, hey, what would Jesus have to say to that? How would Jesus you know, respond to that decision? What do you think Jesus would have to say about this issue? That's the role a Christian mentor plays in your life. But probably, probably most importantly, I think the basis of a healthy Christian mentoring and ment mentee relationship would be one where unconditional love is extended. I think that's the most important quality. I've experienced this a number of times. <laughs> most recently, um, I've, I've got a guy, uh, 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 um, uh, an older man who I happily would say he's one of the you know mentors in my life. And um, you know his name's Joe. And every time we get together, every time we go for coffee, uh, or talk on the phone, as it's the only thing to do now. Um, he tells me that I'm loved. He tells me that he, he tells me that he loves me and that God loves me. Uh, every time we get together, like he's unashamed in doing it. Now you may feel, hey, how do I say that to someone without being awkward or cheesy? And I don't know. But all I know is Joe, it's not awkward or cheesy for him. Maybe he, it's because his age, he's 70. He doesn't hold back in his affection. I don't know. But he, every time I get together with him, he tells me I'm loved. And, um, and I experience the presence of Jesus through that. And I think that's, those are some of the hallmarks. Those are some of the marks of a healthy mentor and mentoring relationship. So as you guys think about this, you're probably saying, well, how do I, how do I start? How do I find a mentor? And I would just say three simple things. One, look around. Look around to whose spiritual journey do you admire? Whose prayer life inspires you? Whose steadfastness in faith um, have you noticed recently? Look around. Secondly, invite, right? Whether you are inviting someone to, to mentor or whether you're looking for a mentor, be intentional. Approach them and tell them, hey, I want to grow in faith. And I know the best way to do that is to do that with the help of another. And that's why, like, we believe in UCM peer mentoring works. You guys can you guys can actually do this with each other because all you're doing is passing off the resources in which you have learned and pointing people to Jesus. So two or more people can do that, can get together and say, hey, we want to grow. And, and that's lastly, the, the, the last thing, just be intentional, set a game plan, you know, um, pick a time, a frequency, uh, ask us for resources we can give you. That's how easy it can be. So here's my final word to you. Um, maybe maybe a final challenge. <laughs> um, and you know, I was reflecting as I was preparing this talk. I was thinking about like, why is it that so many Christian young adults don't have a mentor? Can't answer that question. Um, is it because this generation is too passive, right? In relationships, are they too? Is this generation too lazy? Is this generation too jaded, maybe? You know, I, I don't know. To be honest, I don't know why. But I wonder if the lack of mentors is a result of the lack of Christians who are willing to be mentored themselves. It's really hard to have a Timothy in your life if you've never first had a Paul in your life. And that's why I ask those questions in pair. Who is your Timothy? Who is your Paul? 
And so if tonight, if you didn't have an answer for the question, who is your Timothy, that's okay. I mean, you guys are young, you know, maybe you're not ready yet to, to mentor or disciple someone, but here's my challenge. Well, get ready, right? Seize the day now. Seek being mentored yourself so that you're ready to pass along and find your Timothy as well. Everyone a mentor, everyone a mentee, amen? All right, well, let me close in a word of prayer. And if you guys would indulge me, um, many of you have your cameras off and that's okay. But if you would indulge me, open up your palms to receive because I want to pray for you. Um, Lord, um, we want to live your life. We want to live the way you call us to live. And we know you're calling us to live that life through ourselves. So Lord, would you fill each one here in a way that they wouldn't be ashamed if someone follows after them, if someone looks to them as an example to live after you. And we all confess, we all know that we fall short often. But God, today, tonight, help us to receive your forgiveness, your graciousness, your love. Jesus, we want to be a community of believers who can say, as Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And to that end, would you do the transformation in our souls for your glory, for your honor, for your kingdom, and honestly, for the salvation of our campus, we pray. Amen. Amen.